Does anybody know that they are hypermobile? That's what we're going to talk about. So as a physio, I've been working for quite a number of years as a sports physio and a continence physio, and I really didn't give any credence to hypermobility at all either until the last three years. So it's only in the last three years since this book in particular came out, for those of you that are interested. Okay, and I'm happy to let you have a look that my whole world changed, my clinical world. I, was, I had already become aware of fibromyalgia and the wonderful work that Kay Brand had done through the fibromyalgia network. Okay. Um, I had attended a fibromyalgia symposium at Curtin that some of you may have been at. It was probably three, four years ago and it was wonderful and so I then went on to learn a lot about hypermobility and I'd very much like to share that with you today. And just raise your hand if you can't hear me and I will speak up and I don't mind if you interrupt and ask questions, okay? So this is um, uh, photos of clients that I see. These are obviously off the net, so there's no confidentiality issues. Um, this is a posture that is very common to people with hypermobility. So they tend to stand with their knees locked back. They can have flexible elbows. They often have very sort of forward posture. Um, this is a very common knee position elbows that hyperextend, very athletic children, and weird tricks, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. So what is joint hypermobility? It's where um, most of an indi individual's joints move beyond the normal range, taking into consideration their age, gender, and ethnic ethnicity. So we know that Indian people and Asian people um, and some other cultures, Aboriginals as well, have a greater than normal incidence of joint hypermobility than we do as Australians. So for most people, for many, joint hypermobility is an asset, uh, especially in the arts. So you see a lot of dancers and a lot of musicians even who can actually do uh, very unusual and elegant things with their hands. In sport, a lot of elite sports people are athletic and hypermobile, that's Roger, Roger Federer. Um, but for many, being hypermobile predisposes to pain, fatigue and injury. And you can have a look at Marilyn Munro, by the way she's holding her hand, we actually think that she had classic hypermobility too. Michael Jackson's another that in retrospect, we think probably because of the incredibly bizarre dance moves that he used to do, that he was probably hypermobile. And it's probably no coincidence that he ended up coming into demise because he was addicted to some very strong painkillers. So he probably had pain and fatigue and was barely coping in his, what he was doing. So joint hypermobility is very common. That was my understanding up until about three years ago. Up to 43% of children, uh, more girls than boys. And like I said, more prevalent in Asians, Africans, Indians than Caucasians. So hypermobility does decrease as children grow. So up until the age of eight, we really watch and wait and monitor. But after the age of eight, we know that say 20 to 40% of females will take their hypermobility into adolescence and young adulthood and a lower proportion of men. So approximately 20% of boys and 30% of girls will always be hypermobile. So we have joint hypermobility and then we have joint hypermobility syndrome. So lots of children have hypermobility, but only a percentage have symptoms. And it's only when we know or we suspect that the hypermobility is related to the musculoskeletal symptoms like pain and fatigue, that we can call it joint hypermobility syndrome. Can you hear me okay? That's not too bad. So in history, in the arts, so in paintings and uh, all sorts of records that we have, you can see that hypermobility has always been around, okay? So it's lots of the, um, the Roman paintings where they were actually all in you know, different finger positions and things. It's all very, very common. A um, little bit of history. Uh, in 1967, th there was a doctor, Dr. Kirk, who was the first to actually name the syndrome joint hypermobility syndrome. And he was referring to those um, musculoskeletal symptoms, those with musculoskeletal symptoms in the presence of hypermobility in otherwise normal people. Now, in 1996, 
uh, they added the word benign because it became very clear that even though the symptoms could be very disabling, they weren't actually life-threatening, like some of the under, other syndromes we're just about to touch on. And then, of course, they took that name back, really. We don't really call it benign joint hypermobility syndrome anymore because we realise that it can be incredibly disabling, just like fibromyalgia. And in 1998, Professor Rodney Graham, who is the author of that book, um, classified it as a hereditary disorder of connective tissue. So here we have, um, has anyone heard of Marfan's disorder? Yep, so Marfan forms one, um, oops, right over on the left. These are all what we call connective tissues. So connective tissues are the mo molecules that make up our whole body. So they're, um, collagen is actually in our bones, in our skin, in our muscles, in our joints, and that's all called connective tissue. So on the far left, we have Marfan syndrome. And that is a syndrome where people actually have very, very long limbs. Um, they have certain skeletal um, issues, like they might have um, chest deformities, minor chest deformities, very long fingers. Um, and their arm span, it's probably the most common thing, is actually higher than their height. Okay, and there's a whole criteria if you suspect that you might have Marfan's that you would go and if you fulfill the criteria, then you may have and you would actually go and get diagnosed and assessed. On the far right, we have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Has anybody heard of that? Does anybody know that they have that? Yeah, so Ehlers-Danlos syndrome um, is, is not uncommon and there are seven different types, okay? So we have the classical type, whoops, the classical type of which hypermobility is a category. So hypermobility in the middle. The third category is the same as hypermobility syndrome. So there's a lot of overlap um, in these. And, oops. Um, at the bottom, we also have um, osteogenesis imperfecta, which is when the connective tissue is affected mainly in the bones, and the bones are really soft, so people actually break their bones. And there's been some people in the, in the news, like um, there was a little boy in Perth or Australia called Quentin. He had osteogenesis, so that's probably less common. Okay, um, so this is, um, these are pictures of people towards the more Ellos Danlos spectrum where they have the very fragile skin. They have the hypermobility, but they, they, they also have, they're very prone to bruising and scarring, particularly on the shins. And when, you, you know, a lot of the rheumatologists will look for this sort of picture in an adult, if they see that there's been a lot of scarring go on, then they know that the skin is a lot more friable or a lot more, um, more elastic than, than in other people. Oops. And another feature of the hypermobility is, a, is what we call cigarette paper skin or papyrus scarring, so that if you have surgery, you may just get like a, um, a scarring that looks a bit like cigarette paper. So this is somebody with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome with marked hypermobility, but also you can see the bruising and discoloration that can occur and the really severe hypermobility. Um, this is uh, somebody that's obviously got very translucent pale skin and you can see the veins um, through their skin. This would be one of the more classical types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So people use the term joint hypermobility syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos 3 and the current thinking is that they are synonymous. Okay, so if you say that you have joint hypermobility syndrome, you may be classified as Ehlers-Danlos, but it's not one of the severer forms. Okay, so it's important that people sort of understand that, but it is used synonymously in the literature at the moment. So just like with fibromyalgia, you can actually, ha it can have an incredibly severe impact on your quality of life. The geneticists are working very hard to try and determine what genes cause it. Like we know what genes cause Marfan's disease and we know what genes cause the other types of Ehlers-Danlos, but there's quite an overlap, as you could see, of the features of joint hypermobility and we think that it's different genes. But in time, I'm sure that they will have figured that out. Hopefully sooner rather than later. So joint hypermobility syndrome is an inherited connective tissue disorder. You are born with connective tissue that is like that. It is a domin dominant gene, so it's not going to go away, okay? So it's always been there, and it probably always will. It's not one of those recessive genes that will actually gradually breed out. It will stay. 
um, it affects the collagen and we have different types of collagen. So what we think is that it results in an abnormal ratio of type 3 to type 1 collagen, meaning that at a cellular level, the collagen is more stretchy, okay, of the skin, of the gut. Uh, there's also a proteoglycan, tennyson X, which they think is, a, is relevant. And it's not just the joints, the skin, it is the gut as well. And a lot of people have incredible gut problems with it. Okay, I really like this. I just got this off Google Images, but it's a really nice um, triangle to show that on this side we've got the red, the more severe um, people that have symptoms of what we call complex systemic disorder would be the Marfan's and the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Further up, we have in this mid-range what we call joint hypermobility syndrome, where there might be some joint problems. There might be some other issues with other body systems. Um, at the top, we have the majority of people who are high, hypermobile would probably be more likely to suffer from chronic widespread pain, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue syndrome. That's what those abbreviations stand for. So there's a big overlap really between chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and joint hypermobility syndrome. And for a lot of people with hypermobility, luckily they don't have any problem with it at all. In fact, they use it to their advantage. But like with fibromyalgia, it's a combination of things that can make things symptomatic. Does that make sense? So hypermobility is easy to spot if you're looking for it, but it's very easy to miss if you are not. So up until three years ago, I wasn't looking for it, so I never found it. But I was certainly treating a lot of people with hypermobility, with dislocations, with subluxations and with pain. And I look back and I think now I know what was going on. And even though I wasn't aware of the link, a link with fibromyalgia has been known for several decades. So how do we, what tools do we have to assess whether somebody's hypermobile? Professor Baton was the geneticist who came up with this criteria and we still do use it today. We can all just have a go on ourselves and you can figure out if you are hypermobile classically or not. Your, fifth, your little pinky, if you can actually extend that back to at least 90 degrees, you get a point for each side. So it's a nine point scale. So you've got a score possibly out of two and you can see that's the first picture. Um, if you can, in the second picture, top right, touch your thumb to your forearm. Yeah, all used to be able to. That will count. Then you get an extra point for each side. So we've got a. So you have to put your hand up like this, and then it's whether your thumb will go back towards. Yeah, and don't force it. But if it, if you used to be able to do that. So we've got a possible count of four, so far. Uh, now elbows. I haven't got the elbows pictured, but if your elbows extend, so this would be zero. If, they, if you're a male, it's if they go back past 10 degrees, and if you're female, if they go back, no, sorry, if they go past zero if you're male and more than 10 degrees bending back the other way past that straight line, you get an extra point for each hand, each arm. And if you can, or if you ever could, touch the floor, keeping your knees straight with your hands fully flat on the floor. And the one I've missed was if your knees hyperextend, so my knees do hyperextend, that would be zero, that would be minus 10 or so degrees if you can see me. Like uh, this one. Yeah, so that would be straight and that's certainly hypermobile, more than 10 degrees. Yeah, a lot of people with hypermobile knees will stand with their knees locked. Okay, and that's that classic posture that I showed you on that first slide. So people will get a score out of nine. Does anybody want to say what their score was? My score was eight out of nine just because I had work on my knees done because I dislocated my kneecap. Right. But they would have given me nine out of nine if I hadn't. So. Yeah. A lot of people score nine out of nine. A lot of people, um, if their hips and shoulders are very hypermobile, you'll notice that they're not included on the scale. So you can actually, you know, I, have, I treat clients who I know are hypermobile and it's mainly their shoulders and hips they have problem with, but they don't score on that scale. But generally what they say is that if you score four or above, that you fit the category to being, a, you know, having joint hypermobility. And then we're going to go on and talk about the syndrome. So that's the Baton score, Baton criteria. And then we won't get too bogged down in this because it's changing all the time like everything does. They then devised this Brighton criteria because they, Professor Baton realised that 
It's one thing to have a number, but it doesn't really tell you anything about that person's life or their symptoms. So they came up with this and what you had to do was to have, um, you could either have two of the major criteria, that would mean that you actually had the syndrome, or you could have one of those major criteria and um, two of the minor criteria, and here are the minor criteria, or you could have four of the minor criteria and none of the major criteria. So it's all getting a bit wordy, isn't it? But basically, in people's injury history, um, you know, they'll go through and, and count up. I really like this. This questionnaire is probably the one that I would pay the most attention to because it's the simplest. It, um, it's been proven to be very specific to whether people actually do have joint hypermobility that is symptomatic for them. So it's a five point questionnaire. Can you now or could you ever place your hands flat on the floor without bending your knees? So most people know whether they used to be able to do that. So who could? Majority. Can you now or could you ever bend your thumb to touch your forearm? So it's that test. Yep, so you've already scored two. As a ch this is the one that most people remember. As a child, did you amuse your friends by contorting your body into strange shapes or could you do the splits? Yeah, that's it. Um, as a child or teenager, did you dislocate your shoulder or kneecap on more than one occasion? So the most common are shoulder and kneecap. We certainly see a lot of subluxing hips as well. But they're the most common ones. And it's interesting because the shoulder's not included in that original score. So in time we'll see that change. And do you consider yourself double jointed, which is the other word that is often used when we're talking about hypermobile joints. So if you score more than two, then you probably do have the joint hypermobility and even the syndrome. So I now see lots of kids and teenagers and young adults with um, hypermobility. And these are the presentations that are most common. Often they, um, because of the, the low tone, they're normal motor milestones aren't met as quickly as other children so they may be more clumsy um, they may fatigue more easily they may have more trouble sitting so they may sit sort of in a slumped posture they may complain more than most about lower limb aches and pains and growing pains and growing pains is something that a lot of parents report and they're highly troublesome to families because it's distressing when a child is in pain but Generally, you know, most people will go to the doctor and they're reassured because they know that there's nothing serious wrong, but growing pains can result from um, hypermobility, just being more sensitive. And one thing that we do see in kids and adults alike with hypermobility is that they often get pain after an event, not during. So we think the growing pains is when there's actually been too much activity or too much all at once or not enough rest period. And fatigue, so a child that needs to sleep more than others or rest more than others. So this is a photo of a very hypermobile baby and you can see, are you, can you see through me? <laughs> All right. So as children get older, because just remember, they do naturally sort of um, grow out of their hypermobility, but we start to see in older children, so this is more probably the 5 to, to 12 or 14, pain and headaches. So they start complaining of pain and the headaches is probably the most common complaint. Uh, fatigue, so always tired, low energy. Uh, muscle weakness and incoordination, or it can be the other extreme. We also see people that are incredibly coordinated too, and I think that's what can make it quite confusing to diagnose. Clicking's a big one, so clicking is a bit of a giveaway. Um, if, if around your dinner table there's lots of clicking with the fingers, then that's classic. Uh, I think I've seen most joints click from jaws to ribs to hips to knees every time you get up to ankles to feet to toes and and bruising. So one extreme was that scarring that we saw on the Ellis Danlos um, shin. Often when we see kids we'll be looking at their lower limbs and just they're usually covered in bruises. Not always but sometimes they are covered in bruises. So much so that the parents start to worry that people think that they're actually abusing them. Um, and there certainly have been cases reported of that that have actually not been the case. It's just that the children bruise more easily. Um, difficulty running and being more injury prone and suffering from that latent pain which is pain after activity. And sometimes we see it's the kids maybe in a pre-primary who don't last the week because they're just too tired or they come home and have to go to sleep or they fall to sleep at pre-primary. Or if kids are really quite sporty and they're doing a lot of activity on the weekend, often on Monday they're exhausted. So that's a common presentation too. How old were you when you dislocated your patella? I was 13 and stayed out for a year. 
and then I had a year's worth of treatment. Yeah. So that's um, not uncommon hair history, unfortunately. So we're getting better at picking these things up and where it fits in with everything else. So when we get to adolescence, um, adolescence is a time of incredible change with puberty. We often see too that, you know, once kids have found a sport that they love, they, they're doing a lot more of it. And they're often these days um, doing a lot of sports too. And that can be something that is the trigger for the onset of problems in those that haven't really had any problems to date. So it may be, for example, in dancers, we often see that their hips start to become a problem, they have a lot of pain, there might be excessive clicking. In swimmers and throwers, it might be their shoulders. And I know over the years that as a sports physio, I've treated a lot of these injuries and not really realised that if I had have asked more questions and I had have known more, we could have probably handled them quite differently. So other things that are associated, so these are non-musculoskeletal associations. Pro proprioception, we know that people with flexible joints are actually, um, they don't have as good position sense because there's more range in their joints. Anxiety is overrepresented in people with hypermobility and we don't know if it's a, we don't know enough yet, but we, we don't know if it's a genetic uh, predisposition, whether it's related to the nervous system and the fact that the nervous system is wired a little bit differently, a little bit with, with um, that there's amplification of things. Um, or we don't know if it's because the, there's a sympathetic bias and with a sympathetic nervous system override in a, in a body, you tend to get the fast heart rate, the sweaty palms, and those are the same things as anxiety. So if you've got your body behaving like that, it would be normal to feel the anxiety. But we certainly know that if people aren't anxious because of their pain or their fatigue or their situation, they're predisposed anyway. And in kids, we see this a lot. Has, ever, has anyone heard of POTS before? POTS stands for Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. It is worth knowing the lingo because I think we will be hearing a lot more about POTS. Um, POTS falls under the category of being called an autonomic dysfunction. So we have our central nervous system, our peripheral nerves, and we have our autonomic nervous system. And those are the nerves that control our tummy, our heart rate, our breathing. So they're not generally under our conscious control. And um, the POTS is a feature of the autonomic nervous system not being completely balanced in somebody with hypermobility syndrome. So the symptoms that people would get, actually I'll just go back to that, would be feeling quite lightheaded, feeling quite dizzy, even fainting. Um, so we have kids that faint in class, um, that when they go from sitting to standing, they suddenly drop. And I'm sure we've all been to school with people like that. We think it's, um, you don't have to have hypermobility to have POTS, but there is definitely a relationship. Um, we think it's connective tissue related, such that there's a lot of venous pooling, there's lack of return of blood to the heart. Another related feature is that there's often low, low blood pressure. So people have probably got low blood pressure and to compensate for the low blood pressure, you tend to have a fast heart rate. Okay, yeah. Irritable bowel syndrome, which is very common anyway, um, but we think it's, it's probably related to the, well, two things. The fact that the gut tissue is actually stretchy as well, so it doesn't perhaps, you know, process the food in the large intestine and the small intestine. But also the nerves that control the gut are under the, um, the control of the autonomic nervous system. And so if that's a little bit sort of dodgy, then it affects what the bowel's being told. And for some of the children that I see, the bowel can be the biggest problem. Um, constipation can also have the other, so constipation can also present as constipated sometimes, but then diarrhea, the other, we call that constipation and overflow. Um, so often the parents might come in and they'll say that their, um, their children or the child might be having trouble because they're actually lost control of their bowels, but really they've, they're very constipated and then what follows that is overflow. Um, poor handwriting is a really common association because if the hypermobility affects the hand, then they actually really struggle to grip pens and they get very tired. And we refer to the OTs a lot to, to do some work with that. Poor sleep, is some of this sounding very familiar with fibromyalgia. Um, another classic thing can be resistance to anaesthetics. So people might, well we know that generally the pain of often fibromyalgia or joint hypermobility syndrome doesn't respond well to mainstream medication. We don't fully understand why, um, but also resistance to local anaesthetics and to um, 
If you've actually had dental procedures, often they haven't gone well because you might have needed more anaesthetic. And I had a dentist that explained that to um, us at one stage and they, they said that when they inject into to do like a nerve block for uh, you know root canal or something, it normally gets a blister on top of the gum but with somebody that's got connective tissue that's loose you don't get that blister so it's dispersing away straight away so the effect of the anaesthetic isn't as, as long or as localised. Okay, so what do we do about all this? Um, education obviously is probably the most important thing, trying to, tr to tie in all the different body systems and, and regulate and work with the family. So obviously I'm seeing a lot of children, teenagers, um, you have to get everybody on board. Working with the doctors with pain relief because there are you know medications that are certainly worth trying. Um, I tend to advocate the use of TENS a lot, which I'm sure you've probably heard of because I think in a family situation, you know, when the pain is there, it's really important to be able to do something about it. The big one, which um, is, we all know is not that easy to do, is to pace activity because often the system of somebody who's hypermobile is just not coping well with the workload that they're doing. And when you're talking about sport and um, school, for a lot of kids, those two things are not really that negotiable. You can't stop them going to school and they certainly often love their sport. So pacing is even harder in this population. The mainstream really of joint heart mobility is, is being active. And just like with fibromyalgia, you have to exercise you know, in spite of the pain. If, if these kids and teenagers don't exercise, they just get more and more, more deconditioned and then they're doing less, pain seems more. Um, with kids, we try and make things a lot more fun. So we do a lot of balance activities. We use wobble boards, balance discs to actually um, condition them. There's been a wonderful study come out of um, Sydney just recently about knee control. So probably one of the things I see a lot of is um, knee pain and foot pain in young people. And they actually proved that if they actually do resisted training into the hypermobile range of the knees, that over time, that that was as effective as anything else, which is really exciting. And I think we'll probably see more studies coming out that show us how to best um, provide exercise for people. Relaxation is vital, of course, and with children, it's even harder to teach them relaxation, but there's some wonderful programs around that people are doing. We try CDs at night time that are meditation, anything that, you know, just what we call down trains their system. And I liaise quite a bit with teachers so that some children will have extra rest time in class between activities or after sport. We certainly don't want them held back from sport, but they just need accommodation made. At, at times we use um, braces to support. And of course, the more you ask, the more you sort of find too. So we look at the toileting and the constipation and the autonomic dysfunction. Probably the biggest thing with the autonomic dysfunction is to increase fluids. So it's really um, important that the system of somebody with hypermobility doesn't get dehydrated. So trying to avoid lots of coffee or alcohol. We've just had the pleasure of hosting a physio from the UK who's published quite widely on the autonomic dysfunction. And what they recommend in the UK is to actually really boost the electrolyte level in the, in the system of people with the fatigue and the dizziness. So that's things like salt tablets, extra salt on food, and things like electrolytes. So Gatorade, um, Hydrolyte is the brand name for that sort of thing. Anything to actually sort of boost the system. And yeah, and it's often the salty type things rather than the sweet. Yeah, and a lot of people will say that to me. The system's almost sort of found that out. Yeah, and we, you know, often the parents might say that they've been trying to, um, you know, not let their children have those sorts of drinks because it's a bit of a marketing thing with sport. But in these kids, I think that they really benefit from it. First of all, water. But of course, if you've got bladder and bowel problems, that can get a bit tricky because then they have to go to the toilet a bit more. Um, but just hydrolyte on the days that they're exercising or on days that they've got a full day at school, that can make a big difference. And that, you know, the question comes up, well, you know, isn't salt, you don't want to, you know, have lots of salt. But 
if you've got a child who can't function well because of this, we tend to you know, not worry about that too much because we want to get their system into more of a balance. And same for adults too. Um, yeah, and I spend a lot of time liaising with the schools. Now, this is quite a, we're going okay for time and there's not a lot left to talk about. Um, well, there's plenty to talk about, but not a lot of formal talking. Uh, this is a um, 2000, so this is really new sort of research. Uh, treatment modalities used by paediatric physios for um, joint hypermobility syndrome. So obviously, these are what people actually found helpful. Home exercise program, orthotics, and I must say orthotics, we, we do tend to correct the feet of kids with hypermobility more, we jump in earlier than what we normally would actually, um, because we know that their system's a little bit challenged. Splinting and bracing, electrotherapy, so that means like, you know, if you go to the physio because you've got a sprain or a strain, ultrasound interferential, I'm sure you've all had these things. They might well have short-term relief, but probably not long-term relief. Um, TENS is probably different to that because that's more of a pain modulator that you can do at home yourself. Taping for support is quite helpful, but we do come up with a few challenges with the sensitive skin. Uh, hydrotherapy, now I'm surprised because hydrotherapy is actually, really, there's a lot of really good research going on into hydrotherapy and we think why it's so successful is because the venous, um, we want venous return to be enhanced to the heart and the water does that for us. So when we go for a walk, um, we get circulation happening, but when you're in the water, in the hydrotherapy pool, you've got the pressure of the water. So, you know, I think that we'll, we'll be using hydrotherapy even a lot more. Um, IP treatment, I don't even, can't remember what that is. Anybody think what that is? Um, that's paced exercise, group exercise. Now this is interesting, postural training. So things like Pilates, Feldenkrais, uh, Alexander Technique, Tai Chi, any of those sorts of modalities that aren't high impact but are working on your posture, very, very good. Proprioceptive training. So I would probably classify Pilates as proprioceptive training because it's a very sensory, high sensory sort of thing, which is excellent. Um, even gym work, closed chain would be more like Pilates, open chain is more like exercises using the free weights at the gym perhaps. Reassurance and education, incredibly vital and I'm sure we all know just how important it is to be listened to and understood. And in terms of efficacy, this is 2007, um, this is what people said worked with their pain. Um, so out of all the things, Electrotherapy, not really, so they recommended that we do not use it, uh, except for TENS, that is the exception. Acupuncture, same, which surprises me because I do use acupuncture quite a lot. Um, that's manual therapy, so don't use, so don't expect just a little bit of intervention to make a big difference with these sorts of disorders. Cognitive behavioural therapy, um, somewhat effective, more effective than ineffective, so psychology, Classes, we all know that we benefit from being amongst other people. Um, that's closed kinetic chain, that's gym work. Proprioception, so anything that feels really good and that's sensory is, is helpful and kids love, they really respond to those balance discs and things like that. Reassurance, education and core stability. Uh, so I really, has anyone got anything like this at home? Aren't they lovely? <laughs> so with a lot of the kids, you, the positions that the um, parents report finding their children in are amazing. <laughs> so if their hips are really loose and they'll, they'll just be in all sorts of different positions. So actually having more pillows in the bed is really supportive so that they can actually snuggle in and be in a, quite a nice position when they sleep. Um, at times for dislocating thumbs, I haven't mentioned that, but I do see a lot of young kids with um, dislocating thumbs with sport, so at times we do brace them. At times there are people with, say, pregnancy that we use sacroiliac joint braces on. Orthotics we use a lot. Uh, the pen grips are really helpful and you can even get those little wishbone shaped pens where you, instead of gripping, you're actually resting like that, which are quite nice. And devices like these for seating. Um, has anyone seen this before? It's a really, I use this a lot when we're trying to talk through how people are going to fit their exercise in. So we're just looking at the lower limb joint stress with all these activities. So walking, 
Um, one is not very much stress, three is a lot. So walking is really quite easy on the hips, knees and ankles. Swimming is very easy on the hips, knees and ankles, but the shoulders and the hands do take a little bit of impact. Uh, running we know, does anyone here run? It's not really an exercise of choice because the load is so much greater on the hips, knees and the ankles. Rowing can be a good alternative, but it is still quite um, strenuous on the knees and on the hands in particular, and the shoulders. Stair climbing, hips and knees, I think everyone would know that it would increase the load there. Cycling's very gentle on the hips and the ankles, a little bit more on the knees, but a lot of people, if they have trouble with um, walking, they can manage cycling. Tennis, this was a bit of a surprise to me, that the racket sports were really high load on all the joints. A lot of twisting, turning and sort of sh sharp work. And low impact aerobics, um, moderate on hips, knees and ankles. Does anyone think there's any surprises there? All makes sense to you lot. And then, these are just a couple of little slide shots of things that we recommend. Um, some kids um, really struggle. One of the first things parents might say when they bring their um, kids to see me is that they notice they just, they used to be able to turn the taps, but they have trouble now. Um, I find that with little people, it's really important that their seating is, is just right. So that means bringing the, the footstool up to, to meet them, bringing their work um, station up to meet them as well. And I guess with teenagers, the problem we have now is that they've all got laptops and they're all using their laptop all over the house. And if anything, we just need to raise that surface up, but also look at the position that they're sitting in because they're often on the, on the lounge or wherever, on the floor. And Dr. Murray is the paediatric rheumatologist who is probably the expert in joint hypermobility syndrome in WA. So if you've got any concerns about any of your children, um, he would be the man to see. You can get referred to him by a GP. He also works at PMH. So he says that for by far the majority of patients with joint hypermobility in childhood, the symptoms are mild. Um, others with more persistent pains may continue to have discomfort until their muscles are sufficiently strengthened. But there is, of course, a subgroup whose lives and education are disrupted due to the development of a secondary pain syndrome. And I guess with greater awareness, that's what we're trying to change. Uh, to my families, I always recommend this book. I find this the best one. Um, there's a lot of information if you have a particular interest. This is fabulous. Um, the Joint Hypermobility Handbook is is written for families and it's a whole heap of information that can be easily obtained off um, book depository for free delivery. And there's a free iPhone app that doctors have now that is um, got this same symbol on it and it's helping doctors to diagnose joint hypermobility, um, which is a nice learning tool for families too. So it goes over everything that I've sort of said, but in a very manageable way. And useful links. Um, the first one I would recommend, and I'm sure a lot of you have already come across this, is hypermobility.org in the UK. Um, there's lots of advice on there for uh, teenagers, adults, people with pain. Um, there's a lot about physio and OT, so people can actually get a lot of information and do a lot themselves. Um, ellasdanlos.org. This is a um, support group that was started, it's an Australian support group that was started in WA by two um, girls with Ellis Danlos syndrome and it's a forum where they you can ask questions and you know ask where would you go if I needed this and it's it's a, a nice organization that's going along nicely and this is a, an article that I wrote a year or two ago to raise awareness amongst doctors and that's been that's a journal that the doctors read and that's been um, really good because often they'll contact me and they'll say look you know we've seen these patients and we just didn't realize that it all fitted in that you know the, the problem it's very easy when you've got a child for example with numerous problems for them to get labeled a hypochondriac and mum to get labeled as you know being high demand so when when they actually put all the pieces of the puzzle together it often does make sense which is really rewarding indeed. And that's as much as I've got to say at the moment. Thank you for listening.